Cardinals location all over Muskoka, in different uh, marinas, at Oliver's Coffee here in town in our office. So if you're cleaning up the cottage and find all those non-perishable food items, instead of bringing them back to the city, please consider donating them. Note that you don't have to be an MLM member to donate your food for the food. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll now go back to climate change. And I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Sale. So after education at the University of Toronto and University of Hawaii, Dr. Peter Sell enjoyed a career as marine biologist doing research into ecology of coral reefs in Hawaii, Australia, the Caribbean, and places in between, while holding faculty positions at the University of Sydney, University of New Hampshire, and University of Windsor. He also served as assistant director managing the coastal program for the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment, and Health, based in Hamilton. He now lives with his wife Donna in Muskoka, where, as a chair and past chair of the Muskoka Watershed Council, his current goal is to make Muskoka the most environmentally responsible community in Ontario. That's where we need you. And today, we're going to talk about the recent publication from the Muskoka Watershed Council, Planning for Climate Change in Muskoka, which was published in January 2016. Um, first of all, thank you for coming on a lovely sunny day <laughs> late in the year when sunny days are rare and becoming rarer. So I'm glad to see you here. How do we get rid of this thing that's right in the middle? Does that disappear by itself or? This next, I, know, the yeah. I probably could have figured that out. <laughs> uh, but um, I don't figure out things very well when there's a bunch of people looking at me and what I'm doing with the cursor you can all watch. I kind of freeze. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to talk about a project that the Watershed Council began in 2014 uh, concerning climate change. At the back of the room, I have some booklets, which are the report that came out of that project. And I also have some booklets which are um, a, a very useful handbook for living in cottage country. Both of those are available at $20 each. And the main purpose of those booklets, both of them, is to sit on your coffee table at the cottage so that when your neighbor, who never ever thinks about environmental things, comes in for a cup of coffee, they might actually see them, they might even open them, and they might begin to learn. This is our way of reaching out to the unconverted, the unwashed. And there's lots of them out there, so we need it. Um, the report up from the Climate Change Project is also available for download on our website completely free. But of course, when you download it, you get a PDF and it's not nicely bound and it costs you paper. So it's up to you. Um, I would urge you to at least go to the website and read the beginning and the end of the report. Climate change in Muskoka. Everybody's heard about climate change. We're constantly deluged with information about climate change, whether it's the melting of the Arctic, which this year is the second lowest amount of ice ever. 2012 was the worst, uh, I mean the, the lowest. We hear about melting of the ice in the Arctic. We hear about the bleaching of coral reefs around the world. The Great Barrier Reef has had a very serious bleaching this year. Those are remote environmental effects of climate change. Then we hear about things like fires in Fort McMurray, and we think of them as a human tragedy, and we don't necessarily connect with the fact that those fires are more frequent and more intense because of climate change in many parts of the world, not just northern Canada. So that's climate change. And then this photograph here, hardly anyone thinks of this as climate change. But the Syrian refugee crisis is not only a political or a terrorism crisis, it began as a climate crisis. A long period of a decade or so of drought and warming, agricultural economies collapsed, 
people left the country, moved into the cities, desperate to find work so they had money to feed their families. The crowding in the cities led to unrest. The unrest was solved by authoritarian governments that didn't do a very good job. And the result is Syrians trying to get to Europe, desperate to find a way of living out their lives with some kind of decent existence. It's not only in Syria. We currently have more people on this planet moving involuntarily because of environmental change than at any time in the last thousand years. And that's climate change. Climate change is a big deal. It's been going on for some time. And we're way past the time when we should be debating if it is happening or if we're causing it. And I'm going to give you three facts. The only three facts you need to know to understand what is happening and why. So the first fact is that our atmosphere is a mixture of gases, including some that we give the name greenhouse gas to, because these are gases which, like the glass in a greenhouse, they're transparent to light, but they're less transparent to heat. So light from the sun comes in. It's converted to heat when it hits surfaces on the Earth. Some of that heat is radiating back out into space. Greenhouse gases make it harder for that to get out. If we didn't have greenhouse gases, and these are the most important of them, if we didn't have greenhouse gases, the temperatures on Earth would be like those on the, Mar on moon or on the moon or on Mars. There wouldn't be any life on the planet, and we wouldn't be discussing it. But good. We need greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. So that's the first fact. We have greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. CO2, methane, the two most important. The second fact. <coughs> Some of these greenhouse gases have been getting more and more abundant in recent years. This is the graph for CO2. These are real data. They're derived from instruments that were put up at the top of Mauna Loa in 1958, and they've been recording CO2 concentration continuously ever since, and it's been going up. You can download that from the web at any time. It's updated monthly. You can even download the raw data if you want it. <clears throat> There's no doubt that it is going up. This is the longest direct record of CO2 in the atmosphere that we have. There are other instruments in other places, but for shorter periods of time. And there are other ways of estimating what CO2 concentration was in the past. And we know that around the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, CO2 was down around 280. It's now over 400. That's a big change. Even though that's a small amount of gas, 400 parts per million of the atmosphere. The only way we can explain this fact is to recognize that our global economy uses a lot of energy and we get most of that energy from fossil fuels, and the burning of coal and oil and gas puts CO2 into the atmosphere. We are dumping 36 billion, with a B, 36 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere every year. That's why it's going up. We're doing similar things for different reasons with methane. So that's the second fact. The concentrations of some greenhouse gases are going up. The third fact is a logical extension from those two. You all know this fact. If you add insulation to your attic and continue burning the same amount of energy to heat your house, your house gets warmer, right? So you add insulation to the atmosphere in the form of greenhouse gases. And the temperature goes up. And we can look at temperature records back to about 1880, when people started recording the weather. And you find that the temperature of the planet has been increasing. That is climate change. Once you heat up the planet, you create other changes. 
For example, warmer air is more active. It tends to travel more quickly, so the winds are stronger. Warmer air can hold more moisture, so you get more water vapor up there you get more intense rain when it falls. And all of these things together constitute the change in climate. So those are the only three facts you need to know. All sorts of other facts are out there. There's all sorts of non-facts which are out there presented as facts. There's all sorts of people who don't want to believe this is happening, but it is happening, we're causing it. And it's happening right here in Muskoka. These data, come from the Dorset Environmental Science Center, which is a division of the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. And this is simply a plot of the average date at which ice formed on our lakes every year since 1975. That's this line. And this is the date. So this is later in the year, earlier in the year. Ice is forming later in the year. Ice is coming off the lakes earlier in the year. And as a consequence, between 1975 and now, we've got three more weeks of open water than we used to have. There's three more weeks for the lake to be biologically active, for the lake to be warming up, for the lake to be doing whatever it does, and for the organisms of the lake to be doing whatever they do. That is an enormous change in, in the space of 40 years. Now, an enormous change. And that is climate change. There's no other way to explain that. It's happening because the climate since 1975 in Muskoka has been getting milder. I don't know about any lakes that you know, but the lake I live on last year didn't freeze until early January. Decide to look at it. Uh, and we started talking about this in the summer of 2014. And we decided we should look at climate change because we needed to find out what was going to happen locally and whether there were things that we, the community, should be doing about it. The approach we decided to take was to say, let's look at what the climate is likely to be in the middle of the century and then look at the impacts of that climate on our environment, our um, infrastructure, and our lives. Oh yeah, I forgot. Um, I need to put this in. We chose mid-century for very good reason. It's what we call the Goldilocks time. It's not so far into the future that nobody gives a damn about it. And it's not so close that the difference between now and then is trivial. In fact, mid-century is a time where if you've got kids in school, they'll probably have kids in school. It's not a long time into the future. That's why we chose it. And we said, let's look at what the impact of the new climate will be on our environment, our infrastructure, our lifestyles, and then ask the question, is there anything we need to do? Is this going to be a trivial change? Is this going to be a significant change? Are the things we need to be thinking about? So, some comments on our methods. Now, this is really important. We're not talking about the weather. Even the Watershed Council, as good as it is, cannot predict the weather. So we're not predicting the weather. We're talking about the climate. By definition, the climate is the average of 30 years of weather. There are warm years, there are cold years, there are wet years, there are dry years. You take 30 years of them and look at the average, that's the climate during that 30 year period. So when I talk about the present climate, I'm actually talking about the 1970 to 2000 climate. When I talk about mid-century, I mean 2040 to 2070. We're not predicting the climate. Nobody can predict the future climate. But climate science has the capacity to project the most likely climate if you make certain assumptions about our economy, 
How big is our economy going to be? And what will be the sources of energy it uses? Because if it continues to use the sources it currently uses, we will be putting more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Climate science is very good now at projecting using that kind of information. So how does the Muskoka Watershed Council get information about the future climate? And you know, it's really funny. It's amazing who lives in Muskoka. One of the members of our subcommittee lives in Muskoka. He happens also to be a member of a climate research team at an American university. And that gave him access to what's called the CMIP 5 data set, which you've probably never heard of, and you don't need to remember the name. This is the largest, best set of data consisting of projections into the future using different, well-respected global climate models and using different estimates of what our economy is going to be like as we move into that future. And this is a data set of many, many terabytes of data. This is not something you carry on a single memory stick. Because we had a member who was associated with that, we had access directly to it. We were able to dive into that set of data we chose to use 19 different global climate models, all of which were well-respected models from different research groups around the world. We used a business-as-usual scenario, which suggests that our economy will continue to grow and will continue to largely use fossil fuels for energy. We chose a specific GPS location within the heart of Muskoka. And we dove into this data set with those choices and said, what is the climate in 2050? And so that's the climate that we're talking about. This is the most, oops, this is the most likely climate for mid-century in Muskoka. I'm going to show you first the temperatures. The way this graph is set up, the blue lines are the present climate, the red lines are the future climate. For each climate, what I'm showing you is the average daily minimum and the average daily maximum for every month of the year. The future climate is warmer, no surprise. It doesn't look too bad. It's a trivial weight difference compared to the range between winter and summer. But I draw your attention to two specific temperatures. We'll take the top one first, 30 degrees. We think of 30 degrees as a heat wave. If we have temperatures over 30 degrees, we're having a heat wave. In the present climate, the average summer temperatures in July and August are in the mid-20s, and we get occasional days over 30. This year, we had a lot of days over 30. The future climate is predicted to have temperatures budding right up against 30 as the average condition. We're going to get a lot more hot days in the summertime, a lot more. And then zero degrees, the temperature at which ice melts or water freezes. In the present climate, we have three months of the year, December, January, February, when the average daily high temperature doesn't break through zero. We're frozen. The future climate, only January, barely below zero. So our winters are going to be much more freeze-thaw than they are at the present time. In other words, although the difference doesn't look very great, when you look at what the difference does with reference to these two temperatures, it's profound. 
with a slightly different way of modeling, we actually looked at some statistics on some of those things. Number of days in the year when the temperature exceeds 30 degrees. In the present climate, the typical year, we get about three or four days. And if you think back, most summers, <coughs> excuse me, most summers you get a heat wave of a couple of days, three days, four days long. Sometimes you'd have a summer like the one we just had. Sometimes you'd have a summer there where you had very little of that. But on average, about four days. That's likely to be closer to 27. Down here, the number of winter days where the temperatures break through and you get some melting. And winter days, December, January, February, 36. Jumping to 56. And winter nights, when it is so warm that it doesn't freeze, December, January, February, four, jumping to 19. This is a different climate, very definitely a different climate. Here's the precipitation, the other thing we looked at. We're measuring precipitation as millimeters of rain or millimeters of melted snow. The blue line is the present climate, the red line is the future climate. For each month, we're plotting the total average precipitation for that month of the year. So a typical year would have that much millimeters of rain in that month, or melted snow. You'll see that the future climate is wetter. But you'll notice that most of that extra is in the winter and spring. And in fact, in the months July through October, there's effectively no difference. If you add all those months together to get the total precipitation for the year, you find there's about a 10% increase. We are going to be about 10% wetter than we are now. But it's going to come in the winter and spring. And if we remember that it's also going to be warmer. Much of that precipitation in the winter and spring is going to come as freezing rain or rain rather than snow. And in the summertime, although we're going to get the same amount of precipitation, it's going to be drier because there's going to be more evaporation. And so there'll be less water in the soil There'll be less water in wetlands and rivers and streams and lakes. So again, it doesn't look like huge change, but when you start looking at it more carefully, the change is more than the graph maybe suggests. Now, the one thing I can show you about this climate change is that the expectation from climate science is that the precipitation is going to come in more intense <coughs> storms, more severe storms. So you'll have periods of dry weather and then a really big storm as opposed to gentle storms. Now the other thing I should have said is remember we're looking at the climate in 2050 or around mid-century. The climate change doesn't stop at that point. It does continue into the future. Um, at some, some rate. Uh, so even though that climate looks like it does, remember if we went further into the future, it could be an even bigger change. And this is sort of a summary of what I've been saying. Um, it's going to be warmer and slightly wetter, more pronounced <coughs> storm events. What can we say about the impact on our environment? We decided to look first at our lakes and rivers. And these are the sorts of things that we can say very easily based on that look at the climate. You know, longer ice free season, earlier spring, longer biologically active period, less water flow in late summer, and so on and so forth. But you notice that none of these are very precise statements. Greater risk of spring flood. How much greater? A little bit greater, a lot greater, not very precise. And the reason we're not being precise is because of a very funny situation. 
You know, Muskoka has a fantastic record over a number of years of different groups collecting information to monitor the quality of our lakes. And the MLA, of course, has been one of the leaders in that. Some of this monitoring is done by citizens. Some of it is done by professionals. We do a lot of monitoring of our lakes. And yet, we aren't monitoring the kinds of things we would need to know to be more precise about these kinds of statements. Because how the system responds to the climate is going to depend on the changing climate, but it's also going to depend on is it a deep lake? Is it a shallow lake? Is it a lake that is very open and exposed to the wind as opposed to a lake which is more protected so that it's sheltered? Those all have impacts on how a particular lake will behave. And how the whole of Muskoka will behave depends on how the different lakes behave. There's only a handful of our lakes where the scientists have sufficiently detailed monitoring that we can go any further. Because with detailed monitoring, you can take the data for the lake and you can put it into a model and then change the climate and see what happens. And that's what we did using Hart Lake. And we chose Hart Lake in particular, we could have chosen others, we chose Hart Lake because it's very well studied and it appears to behave in a way which is quite similar to the way the total Muskoka watershed behaves. Hart Lake is a small lake <coughs> northeast of Huntsville. It has six inlets, one outlet, um, I forget where the outlet is, up, up at the top right corner, one outlet, six inlets, all of them are gauged so the scientists know when and how much water comes in when and how much water goes out. There's a weather station on the shore, so you know the actual rainfall around this particular lake, because of course it does vary. There are instruments in the middle of the lake to record all sorts of things, and there's a regular sampling program where samples are collected, other mm -hmm. kinds of analysis. They know a lot about this lake. We were able to take this lake, show that the model produced the pattern of outflow that we were reporting, so we know the model works, and then change the climate to see what would happen under the new climate. And this is what we found. And there were some surprises. This is the first surprise. Remember I said that in the warmer climate there'd be more evaporation and more transpiration by the plants, particularly in the summertime. The increase in evaporation and transpiration under this new climate is sufficient to fully take care of the extra precipitation. So the 10% more rainfall goes back again in precipitation, in, in transpiration, and the outflow from that lake barely changed. In fact, it went very slightly less outflow than at the present time. That surprised those of us who were working on this project quite a bit. We didn't realize the effect on evaporation and transpiration would be so great. So you get 10% more rain coming down, but it's going back up quickly and not contributing to flow out of the lake and down the river and all the rest of it. So if you put that into the context of Muskoka, the amount of water being delivered to Georgian Bay doesn't change because the extra that's coming in goes back up into the atmosphere. That surprised us a lot. <coughs> Second thing that surprised us was that this shift of precipitation towards the winter, this increased winter precipitation, resulted in a much more strongly seasonal outflow than we thought it would. It turns out that if you look at the four months from December through March, there will be three times more water flowing than there is now. And depending on the year, that may be flowing throughout the winter, or it may be all freezing up and then thawing at the end of the winter, but three times more. 
and the other eight months of the year, only half as much water flowing as now. That's a big deal. Oops, sorry. That's a big deal. Particularly this one. Those people who have been upset by the damage caused by the flooding in recent years, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, this is a lot worse. We're not talking about three millimeters more. We're talking about three times more water flow. That's a significant change. So is this other one. Half as much water flowing. Late summer and fall, we're going to have wetlands drying up. We're going to have streams drying up, waterfalls non-existent. What's going to happen to our lakes when there's less water coming into them? Anybody who thinks that we're going to be able to control lake levels so that they remain more or less constant in our big lakes without major manipulation is dreaming. It ain't going to happen because we're moving into a regime of a much more seasonal flow through the system than we've had in the past. Peter, if, if yep. to your first point, increased evapotranspiration, whatever, yep. took care of the increased precipitation, where is this water coming from to, to be three times more flooding? What, what's happening is there is there is the the extra precipitation is being taken care of by the transpiration and the evaporation, but the the amount of precipitation, I mean, let me try it again. The extra precipitation is coming in the winter. The extra evaporation is coming in the summer. On an annual basis, the evaporation takes care of the extra precipitation. But what we have is a much drier summer and a much wetter winter. Okay. Does that make it clear? Yes. Does that mean in the summer that the water levels would be and unfortunately, although we know a fair amount about how algae and algal populations grow in our lakes, we don't know enough to be able to predict with any precision what is going to happen, what kind of conditions are going to cause algal blooms. We don't want Muskoka lakes to look like this. This is Lake Winnipeg. We don't want Muskoka lakes to look like this. But we need more information before we can even begin to talk about what might be possible to prevent that happening. And so there's a need for, more, for new science. And one of our recommendations uh, addresses that. And this is true for a number of other things. One of the things that people need to understand about climate change is what is happening at the present time is completely new in all of human history since the beginning of agriculture. So over the past 8,000 years, we have lived on a planet where the climate is more or less dependable. Yes, you have droughts. We had the dust hole in the 30s, and so on and so forth, and the mini ice age. Those are very small variations in climate. We are adapted to this particular climate. We build our cities close to sea level because sea level hasn't been changing in 8,000 years. Now suddenly we're in a world where the climate is changing and sea level is rising and drought is becoming more pervasive. This is new. And so how we adapt to it is going to require some real intelligence. Now, I always like to tell people that our watershed is mostly dry land. Because there's too many people who think the word watershed means lake and a little tiny bit along the edge, maybe this wide, we'll, we'll keep it nice. No, um, I'm sorry, the watershed is basically the whole thing. Every place in Muskoka is part of a watershed because that any rain landing there gets to a lake eventually. So we looked at what will happen to forests. You might expect that with this warmer, longer growing season, our forests will be wonderful. Um, not quite. Those of you who are gardeners, any gardeners here? 
You've heard about plant growth zones. You buy plants that are adapted to your climate. And if you've been gardening for a few years, you know that the growth zones have been moving north. And trees have growth zones too. These are white spruce. They're a common tree in Muskoka. This is a story about white spruce. This is the present. This is not the distribution of white spruce. This is the climate that white spruce is adapted to. And Muskoka is a very happy place for white spruce. This is mid-century. This is the end of the century. What's going to happen to our white spruce? As a population, they are going to dwindle away. As individual trees, they will live shorter lives. They will be more susceptible to disease. They will be unhappy, and they will eventually be gone. They won't be reproducing very well. Hopefully, they'll be getting seeds further north, but whether they can do it this quickly is a, is a serious question. This is a particularly extreme case. But every single tree that lives in Muskoka at the present time is going to be more stressed by this warmer, drier climate than it is in the past. And a lot of them are going to disappear. If you like maple syrup, eat it now. Um, the another thing that's going to happen is the summers are going to favor fire. The risk of fire is going to be greater. National Resources Canada has done a study on this and estimates that by the end of the century, central Ontario, which includes Muskoka, should expect a six-fold increase in the risk of fire. Now, fire shapes forests. There are trees that are fire tolerant. There are trees that thrive in a fire regime. There are trees that are fire sensitive. And if you change the frequency of fire, you slowly change the composition of that forest. Never mind the risk of property losses. There's going to be a change in the nature of the forest simply because of an increased <coughs> rate of fire. And then finally, there's going to be, because of the milder climate, the number of pathogens that can't live here in the 20th century will be able to live here. We're already seeing beech bark disease in Muskoka, and it's doing a serious number on some of our beech populations. The emerald ash borer is expected to be here very soon. It's a cute little guy. If you see one, tell somebody. I would suggest the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change or the Ministry of Natural Resources, either one of them would be a good person to tell. Or tell the Watershed Council and we'll tell them uh, they're coming. There's probably others that are going to come. These will change our forests as well. And so what we're faced with is the fact that over the next few decades, by the time your children have children of their own in school, you know, or your grandchildren have grandchildren of their no, the grandchildren have children of their own in school. Our forests are going to deteriorate. Probably. They're certainly going to change. And our management of forests is going to have to change as well. Because we've never had to manage environment when the conditions of the environment changing. We've always had to manage to prevent human impacts that were deleterious. We've never had to manage to cope with changes that are sort of outside local human activity. We maybe will have to help southern trees get here because the economy changes so quickly we need to bring them in. If you're planting trees, plant oaks rather than maples. I love maple trees, but get used to the idea that the wonderful colors of the maples are going to be north of North Bay, well north of North Bay. OK, infrastructure and our lives. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but we look in, in the report of all of these. This is new human diseases. Zika is not here, not likely to get here. But it's an example of the sort of thing that is happening in terms of new human diseases moving into places. 
If you like ice fishing, do it now. Have your maple syrup and then go out ice fishing. You know, in a few years' time, you know, um, winter road maintenance. There are going to be cold years with lots and lots and lots of snow because there's going to be all that extra precipitation. And there's going to be mild years with lots and lots of freezing rain and ice and frost heating and all the repairs that that requires. So our capacity to manage winter roads is going to have to be increased because we're going to have to be capable of dealing with the, with the snow and the freezing rain and the ice. Stormwater management, the same thing. If the flow of water in the winter is three times what it is now, we better take a careful look at our drains. Both the downspouts from your house and the erosion that can happen at the end of the downspout and the municipal drains and the culverts under the roads, all those things. Electrical and data grids, the more frequent, more intense storms. Next time you see Hydro One out in a bad set of weather, repairing the lines and stringing them back up among the trees, ask yourself if that is a sensible thing to do. Because if they started putting them underground and kept putting them underground, after a while, they wouldn't blow down every time the wind blew. And if you don't think our economy is going to need reliable electricity and reliable data, then you haven't been listening to the people in charge of Google and Facebook and all those people. We're going to need a more resilient electrical grid and data grid than we have, and the conditions are going to make that more difficult. Now, the Watershed Council believes that we must adapt our building infrastructure. This is a responsibility of our governments, and it's a responsibility of us as citizens to make sure they undertake this responsibility. We've got to take care of things so that we don't have disasters. And that requires investment, which some people call wasteful government spending. Um, we also believe that we should modify our individual lifestyles, and I don't mean going off the grid and living in a cave and learning to make uh, food without cooking it. I'm talking about modifying our lifestyles so that we have a modern, sophisticated lifestyle with all our wonderful toys, but without producing a lot of carbon pollution. And the reason we think we should be doing this is because we have a responsibility to do our part to help Canada do its part to help the world do the job of bringing this climate change thing under control. If we all modify our lifestyles and everyone else goes on the way they were, it won't have a huge effect. But if we don't do our part, we're doing the wrong thing. So. But that's probably less immediately important than the first one. We've got to do something so that we're ready for what's coming. So I'm nearly done. Muskoka is not immune to climate change. The good news is that what's coming is not impossible. It's not impossible at all. We can deal with this quite easily. But there are clearly some changes that are going to require some and so we have a decision. We, the people of Muskoka, the permanent residents, the seasonal residents, the governments, the industries, everyone, we have a decision to make. We can ignore climate change. Yeah. It was an interesting talk. It was a pity it was such a wonderful day. I could have been on the dock at the end of September. But it was an interesting talk. And yeah, it was more we can plan ahead and we can act to adapt. And if we're planning ahead and acting, we can also act to mitigate some of the changes so that they aren't as severe as we think they're likely to be. For instance, changing the way we manage forested land so that it better copes with what's coming and we retain a forest. 
It won't be the same forest, but it will still be a forest as opposed to a place with far fewer trees. That's what I mean by mitigating. Needless to say, the Watershed Council recommends that we don't <coughs> stick our heads in the sand and refuse to believe it. Now, the report finishes with 15 recommendations, and I am not going to go through 15 recommendations for you. They're directed to different people, some to individuals, some to government, some to industry, some to other sectors. Some of them are large, some of them are small. For individuals, learn about what's happening. Undertake to lower your own personal carbon footprint. For the community, support research on our blooms, which means finding ways to encourage academic scientists to, to do some research here on algae. The Dorset people are already doing research on algae. They need more help. Find ways to support that research. It's amazing what a little bit of seed money can do to cause an academic scientist to run in with some eager graduate students to do things. We're already meeting with uh, the Dorset Environmental Science Center scientists talking to them about likely things to do in connection with algae. We'll be coming out to lake associations um, in the relatively near future to bring them up to speed with what we're talking about. Um, and there may be some parts of it that can be beneficially aided by having uh, volunteers, uh, citizen science taking part. But we need to encourage research on this because we don't want to sit there and watch our beautiful, healthy, lovely to live beside lakes degrade. Provide landowners with information so they know how to manage their trees in a changing world. It's different to the way it used to be. Um, this one here I'm going to come back to in a minute. Support those who strive to plan and act. That's a polite way of saying to citizens, when you vote, at any level of government, vote for the candidate who says she is going to try and do something, rather than voting for the candidate who says she is going to lower your taxes. This may be a novel experience for people to make that kind of voting decision. There's lots of people who've been voting for years to have their taxes lower and lower and lower. There are actually times when it's necessary to spend money, and this is one of them. So supporting people who are trying to plan for the future is a good thing to do. I said I'd go back to this one. This is the biggest recommendation. It's directed to three provincial ministries. It's directed to the power industry, some other segments of the economy. It's directed to citizens and municipal governments at both levels in Muskoka. Undertake a major planning and infrastructure project to hold water back to be available to flow in summer and fall. This is not going to be cheap. If we don't do it, our lakes and our waterways are going to change in ways <coughs> that we would never have recognized. And it's not going to be because of anything that your neighbor did on his or her property. It's going to be because the climate has changed and it's become much more seasonal full of water. If we want to keep something of the wonderful Muskoka we have, we need a way to keep water up there. And it can't be done simply by requiring that the ministries obey the current plan, which was never intended to control the flooding anyway. Uh, it's going to need new infrastructure. What type of infrastructure are you talking about? I'm talking about dams. I'm talking about other ways of holding water back. Um, I think right now we should probably be 
making it a, a criminal offense that we might bring back the death penalty for anybody who kills a beaver because they do a wonderful job of keeping water uphill. You may not like that piece of news, but they do a wonderful job of keeping water uphill. And we need to keep water uphill as much as possible. Now, do we want beavers everywhere? No. But they could be a part of the solution. But I'm thinking more of the, um, the, the parts of the solution that we would directly control. And it would be really regulating how much water gets down in the wintertime. At the present time, what we do is we flush it all out hoping that there'll be enough in the spring to fill it up to where we want it. The problem is that that's a very risky thing because you never know how much. What we've got to do is keep it up there so it's available to go down. And anybody who says you can't do this, Lake of Bays is currently five feet higher than it used to be in the 1800s. Because in the 1800s, they needed it higher to float logs somehow. And so they made it higher it's possible to make these kind of changes. I'm not suggesting making Lake of Bays another five feet higher, but I'm suggesting we need to be looking at creative ways of keeping water in our watershed available for the summer and fall. And that may be tricky, and it may not be entirely keeping it uphill. It may be doing things to prevent the rate at which it dries out. You know, much more attention to looking after the care and feeding of wetlands because they're wonderful sponges. So that's the biggest recommendation that's in here. Um, but there are a number of others, and I urge you to go to the report and, and read it. Um, people ask me, what can I do? Or sometimes they say, well, anything I do won't matter. You know, if I stamp my foot, nothing happens. If the entire population of China stamps its foot, something happens. It creates movement of the earth. You know? That's why when armies march across bridges, they break step. Individual actions that are small, when all done together, can make a difference. So learn about climate change. Understand that it is happening and what the implications might be. Um, reduce your own carbon footprint. Next time you're trading in your car, just ask yourself how many times you use the four-wheel drive capacity to go to the supermarket to buy the milk. And then ask whether you need an SUV with four-wheel drive capacity, really. And couldn't you do with something smaller and more economic? Become a better environmental steward goes without question. And then, as I said, support those people in government who are talking about forward planning and action, rather than the people who are saying, no, we'll defer it. It hasn't happened yet. We don't know for sure that it's going to happen, so we won't spend any money on it. We'll reduce your taxes. That's what individuals can do. And I like to always close any talk I give in the scope of this. Um, just reminding people how lucky we are to live here. Um, there are many places in the world that are fantastic. There are lots of places in the world that are me. Muskoka is not me. Muskoka is fantastic. And the good news about the whole study of climate change that our, that our exercise brought out really good news is that if we have the wisdom to plan ahead, we can keep it fantastic. It won't be the same as it is now, but we can keep it a jewel in central Ontario. So I think we have a choice to make, and I think now is the time we need to make it. Thanks very much. Which will keep me warm when I run my thermostat a little bit lower. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes.
I was interested in your comment on the biological activity in the lake that's increasing by three weeks over the last 50 years. Last, since 75. And I'm wondering about what is the difference in the biological activity between southern northern Ontario and northern northern Ontario? I mean, there's a, uh, just north of Toronto where the lake unfreeze a lot sooner than they do up in the part of the lake. Yeah. Yeah. Can you get any information from that? I haven't any information from that. I mean, one of the things that we do know from um, information about climate change is that the, the, the change in temperature which is happening is more extreme the further away from the equator you get. So the, the changes in, though we talk, let me give you an example. We talk about the world climate and the idea, I mean, the United Nations has got the Paris Accord, which says we're aiming for no more than a two degree increase over present day, which means end of 20th century. No more than a two degree in, in, increase for the whole globe. That recognizes that there are parts of the globe that are going to be a lot warmer than that. We're already butting up against two degrees here in Muskoka. And if you go up to um, Whitehorse, so, so the, the, what I'm trying to say is that the situation is different from place to place. Um, and, and we're sort of a, a little bit on the, we're going to be a little bit warmer than the, can we say it another way, the increase in temperature here is going to be a little bit more than places further south, um, uh, when, you know, the southern U.S. or Caribbean. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more, more extreme an increase here than there, um, and less than further north. Um, and, and then similarly, the change in precipitation. In our case, we're getting 10% wetter. There are other places where it will barely change, and there are other places getting drier. As a general rule, the places on the planet which are currently dry are going to get drier, and the places which are currently wet are going to get wetter. So it, it's, um, it's, it's complicated and it's messy. Yeah. I just wanted to pick your brain on uh, some of the infrastructure changes that you foresee. Um, I mean, it's lovely to depend on the beavers, but mm -hmm. I'm assuming you've got more dams in mind. I think I read somewhere there's something like 19 dams in a sort of watershed system. I do, not, I do not have any preconceived notion of what kind of infrastructure changes we would make. First of all, there's the need to look at our existing built infrastructure. Is it sufficient for what's going to be thrown at it? So for municipalities, the concern is drains, um, the culverts on the roads, all of that sort of thing. Are they built to be sufficiently large that the expected volumes are not going to cause problems and wash out roads and do that kind of thing? Similarly, are we building our um, buildings so that they are as um, energy efficient as possible, so that we're reducing the demand for energy, which means we can use less energy, which means less fossil fuels contributing to climate change. Um, those two things need to go along. And, and in fact, if you look at what municipalities are doing in Ontario, there's a lot of progress being made in those kinds of things. And uh, Muskoka is certainly um, thinking about uh, looking at the, the way they handle stormwater and whether they've got places where they've got to address it. And, and these things cost money, but, but they're looking at it, and that's good. I don't know whether they're looking at it with sufficient urgency, but there is a program of you know regular renewal of infrastructure. I'm talking again about ditches and drains and things. Um, and it's very, very simple to upgrade by when you renew, you increase the diameter or you increase the strength or whatever. These are these are technical things that I'm not qualified to talk about. The point that the Watershed Council is making is we have a need to make these infrastructure investments and the best way of making them is to start planning and doing it and getting thinking about it.
Then you get down to the nuts and bolts of well, what do we need to do and where are the problems, where are the pressure points. And, but it is a, a need to make the change is sort of the first step. And you say, now what has to be done? When it comes to the business about um, helping keep water uphill, that, I think, needs a major effort and it would begin with a with a significant hydrological study so that we actually understand in detail what the flows are, where the water comes from, where it goes. Some parts of Muskoka are on average wetter than others. And we've only looked at you know one one example for one place. So that there's a lot of stuff there. It is a big undertaking and it, it really needs um, groups to come together and sit down and say, okay, what have we got to do? And, and I think that is, is an important thing. It started as soon as possible because these things, again, also take time. You know, we're talking about um, changes in infrastructure that might require investments of planning over, over a decade or two decades. And you need to plan ahead and do it properly. You don't want to the one thing I'm trying to get people to understand is that we don't want to wait until there's a disaster and then run in and flail around. That's the worst way of fixing problems. You fix them ineffectively and you spend way more money doing it. If you do it carefully and programmatically, it can be a lot more effective. So, yes? I don't really have a question as much as I have an observation and I don't know, I'm not sure many of us following climate change actually used to call the global warming since the inconvenient truth and Dan Quill. And we haven't attended many seminars, we watched TV, David Suzuki. Nobody's ever said anything about the notion of population control and reducing the population where we all know that the you know bigger, better, faster, we're talking about getting more efficient cars and turning our thermostats down, but nobody's ever said you know if the industrialized world's thought Yep. maybe reduce the population, the, the volume of energy that we're using and the amount of food that we have to grow and the energy we have to put into the food, feed the growing population, nobody's ever said, why don't we just reduce the population? Good. Just excellent, excellent. You know, excellent. Happening. I'm, I'm going to say it's, it's not true that nobody has ever said anything. In fact, I said something. <laughs> I wrote a book a couple of years ago on the environmental crisis, which includes climate change, but there's a bunch of other things. And I debated as I was writing the book I wasn't going to put population in it at all. And I finally said I have to. And so there's a chapter on population. I think um, the need to recognize that we have more people on the planet than can comfortably be supported right now is um, very real. There is a great resistance to discussing it. China has been criticized immensely for its heavy-handed regulation of how many children you can have. But I'll tell you one thing, China has brought its, it hasn't brought its population down yet, but it has brought its rate of growth down to Western levels. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese are now worried in the same way as Japan or Europe or even North America worried about not having enough young people and too many old people, which is one of the things that happens when you slow population growth down. They brought it down very, very quickly to Western levels. India, very democratic, lots of persuasion, no enforcement. They haven't done very much with their rate. And I do not honestly know how you govern a country when you have all sorts of needs of you know, food, shelter, water, and your population is doubling at the rates that are going on in some of these countries. It's a huge problem, and it is a huge part of this thing we are doing to the planet. Um, I tend to keep it out of conversations about climate change because it deserves a discussion all of its own, and also because it is a very emotional issue, and it is very difficult to get people to to appreciate what you're talking about. I'm not talking about killing people. I'm not talking about you know, castrating everybody. I'm, but the idea that we will passively say, oh yes, 
the population is currently 7 million and um, by 2050 we expect it to be 9.5 million and we'll have to grow more food. Well, guess what? We're having trouble growing the amount of food we grow right now. And, and it's not a simple task to grow more. If I um, just, I'll sorry. tell you one more thing about, client, about population. Um, when I was born, the population of the planet was under 2 billion. So in my life, I have gone through a tripling of the population on the planet. When I was a teenager living in Richmond Hill, I wasn't afraid to drink water out of a stream. It was probably a stupid thing to do, because there were cattle around. Um, but you could do that and more or less get away with it. I never recollect being out on a hike and drinking water out of a stream and then having severe stomach reaction. Today, it's rather different. And guess why? Because there's three times more of us on the planet. A uh, huge problem. Yes. Um, first of all, I found your comments on the whole scope area really fascinating and um, new to me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the population issue, though, is something that I actually like to comment on. I mean, most of the Western world barely can sustain the population levels that they have, and that's almost true in China these days. But when you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, you have several countries, uh, Nigeria, uh, uh, Ethiopia, who have you know are Enormous six rich. or seven children per family, yeah. and it's also the site of the biggest drought. Yeah. I mean, Newton, sub Northern Africa, the biggest drought in the world, which is creating all kinds of havoc. I mean, a lot of the stuff that's happening in Northern Africa it is not terrorist kind of related. It's, it's drought related, right? Yes. Yes. And so how many people are doing the kind of work that you were describing, making the connection between water and, um, and, and uh, population? Because, I mean, there's a certain finite amount of water, and there's not a finite amount of people, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah I understand what you're saying. There's, there is a lot of effort. Um, the United Nations has um, huge groups of people who are talking about it all the time, um, and some people who are trying to do something about it all the time. Um, it is, I'm not going to pretend for a moment that it is effective. Uh, but that is just one of many critical issues that we're, we're confronting on this planet at the present time. We have populations which are growing very, very rapidly. We have resources which are finite or getting less. Uh, we have, um, for instance, there are numerous fisheries in the world which are, which are going down because they have been overfished. If they had been fished responsibly, we would be currently getting more fish out of them than we do now. But because they've been overfished, their numbers